Are the Chinese crazy or brilliant? In the middle of a desert the size of a small country, where the wind once carried nothing but dust, farmers planted potatoes. Yes, potatoes. At first the world laughed. Sand isn't soil and deserts aren't farms. But then, something strange happened. Green fields spread across golden dunes, and soon international experts were flying in, asking the same question you might be thinking right now. How did they do this? Let's put the scale into perspective. In a barren wasteland covering 42,200 square kilometers, that's bigger than Switzerland, China turned nearly 4,000 acres into fertile potato fields. With the help of 12,000 local farmers, harvests reached up to 430 kilograms per acre, producing an astonishing 1.7 million kilograms of potatoes a year. This isn't science fiction. It's happening today. So is this a miracle of modern science? or a gamble that could change the way humanity fights desertification and food insecurity. To answer that, we need to look back at the problem China faced and why deserts once threatened not just their crops, but their very way of life. To understand why this sounds impossible, we need to see what China was up against. Picture this. You've just seen a desert turn green with potatoes. But that miracle makes no sense until you know what China was fighting against. China wasn't always a success story. At its worst, desertification touched 2.622 million square kilometers, nearly 27% of the country. This wasn't just land turning to sand. It meant crops failing, homes abandoned, even health crises from choking dust. The mood is heavy. We feel the weight of the stakes. Faced with this, China launched one of the world's biggest restoration efforts, and then pushed farther. From sand-choked skies to green ambitions, China's answer wasn't small. It was a nationwide mobilization, policy, money, and sheer manpower. China mobilized policy, money, and people, building 41 demonstration zones and planting billions of trees, a national push against the sand. The principle was simple, green advancement, desert retreat. Trees can stop sand, but trees alone don't feed people. The next leap was bolder, growing food on sand. And that leap brings us to a desert most thought hopeless. The Mu Us, the Mu Us, a yellow band in northwest China, once one of the country's biggest dust sources. Annual rainfall, a meager 250 to 440 millimeters. This isn't farmland, it's one of China's four great deserts, and it barely rains half as much as what most crops need. So how do you go from that to potatoes? You start small, and you experiment. And in 2016, that's exactly what scientists tried. From 2016, scientists tried a low-impact approach, minimally invasive planting, to give life a fighting chance in sand. The idea was simple. Disturb the desert as little as possible, then let the plants do the work of stabilizing it. Tree trials worked. And with confidence rising, farmers began to wonder, if trees can grow, could food grow too? That daring question set the stage for the next leap. Potatoes. In 2018, a team of scientists mapped soils and microclimates, and the government backed it with a $350 million push. We looked for places where sand and water could cooperate. The goal wasn't to conquer the desert, it was to read it and then adapt. Even with research and cash, one challenge remained, water. How do you water a desert without wasting it? The answer came from an ancient idea of floods. The Muas Desert doesn't get steady rain, but it does get floods. For centuries, local rivers would swell after seasonal rains, rush across the land, and then vanish. To most people, these floods were destructive, but scientists saw them as a gift. They used flood irrigation, not to drown the desert, but to teach it how to hold life. Water plus silt equals soil. The logic was simple but powerful. Floodwaters spread across prepared plots. Instead of running off, water slowed down and seeped in. Silt settled out. This fine, nutrient-rich sediment created a starter soil layer on top of the sand. Root zones formed. With just a few centimeters of silt, crops could anchor, trap more organic matter, and slowly turn desert into farmland. We weren't just adding water. We were training the desert to keep it. But there were cautions, too. Too much flooding could wash away plots. Too little water meant no silt layer. And if overused, the land risked salinization, a deadly salt crust that kills crops. With risks managed, the desert floor began to change. Suddenly, there was soil where only sand had been. And with soil and water in place, it was time to try the unthinkable, growing food. 
With the soil prepared, the scientists and farmers finally took the leap planting food in the Mu Us Desert. The chosen test crop? Potatoes, hardy, calorie rich, and capable of growing in marginal soils. The first pilot, 20 acres. The result, 3,000 kilograms of potatoes, about 150 kilograms per acre. A modest start, but proof it could work. That yield was five to six times lower than what ordinary farmland would produce. But for the desert, it was groundbreaking. The real success wasn't just the potatoes. It was the survival of the crop through wind, drought, and heat. To improve, the team experimented with varietal choices, testing potatoes bred for arid climates, looking for resilience over size. They worked on planting density, spacing rows to reduce wind exposure while still maximizing land use. For pest management, they tried simple, low chemical methods like crop covers to prevent soil-borne diseases. Yield was low, but survival and basic productivity were the big breakthrough. It wasn't enough to feed a nation, but it answered the most important question. Food could grow here. Proof in hand, they scaled up, quickly and ambitiously. Once the pilot proved it was possible, the project shifted gears from experiment to movement. The desert that once seemed lifeless now became a canvas for large-scale farming. They went from dozens of acres to nearly 4,000 acres, enlisting 12,000 farmers. By 2023, yields rose, in some areas, to 430 kilograms per acre. The expansion wasn't just about land, it was about people. Thousands of families joined the effort, each taking small plots and applying the new desert planting techniques. Farmer cooperatives pooled labor, shared equipment, and coordinated harvests. What's striking is the speed of improvement. Within just a few years, average yields nearly tripled from the pilot stage. Farmers mastered soil preparation, optimized irrigation timing, and began to integrate simple innovations, like protective mulch layers and windbreak rows, that made the crops more resilient. We never imagined potatoes would grow here. Now we not only grow them, we depend on them. These numbers weren't just statistics. They represented food security, income, and proof that life could flourish in the sand. And those numbers weren't abstract. They transformed real families' lives. The desert fields weren't just a scientific milestone. They were a human revolution. For decades, families in the Moot Use Desert had lived with uncertainty, sandstorms destroying crops, scarce water, and little chance to escape poverty. But with potatoes taking root, everything began to change. Beyond soil and stats, these fields rewrote family budgets. Some farmers now earn over $10,000 a year, a dramatic shift in one of China's toughest regions. For many, potatoes weren't just food, they became a currency of change. Families who once survived on subsistence farming could now pay for health care, send children to school, and invest in sturdier homes. Local markets buzzed with trade, and secondary industries like storage, trucking, and packaging began to emerge. Before, we worried about dust storms every season. Now we worry about market prices for our potatoes. That's a worry we welcome. This agricultural success also gave communities something harder to measure, but deeply valuable hope. Instead of watching young people leave in search of work, many chose to stay, invest in the land, and believe that the desert could support a future. This wasn't just agriculture, it was social renewal, a shift from survival to opportunity. And the benefits weren't only economic, the desert itself began to change shape. What makes the Mu'a story so remarkable is that it wasn't just about food or money. It was about reshaping the land itself. For decades, the desert had been advancing, swallowing villages, fueling sandstorms, and destabilizing ecosystems. But with careful management, the tide began to turn. This was ecological restoration and agriculture in one. Nearly 94% of Mu'a's sandy land is now under effective management an extraordinary reversal of desertification. But while the transformation is inspiring, it comes with trade-offs. Large-scale potato cultivation depends heavily on water. In regions where annual rainfall averages just 250 to 440 millimeters, every drop counts. Overusing irrigation risks, draining underground reserves, and could even create soil salinity where minerals left behind make the soil toxic for plants. There's also the danger of monoculture. Relying too heavily on potatoes makes the system vulnerable to pests or disease outbreaks. Scientists are already urging crop diversification, wheat, millet, or drought-tolerant vegetables, 
to balance resilience with productivity. Yes, this is a success, but the real challenge is balance, farming the desert without exhausting it. The Mu'a story shows how desserts can be tamed, but also reminds us that nature always demands respect. And this success hasn't gone unnoticed. Other countries are now asking, could this model work for us? The Mu'as experiment didn't stay a local secret for long. Its success drew global attention, especially from countries where deserts dominate the landscape. In 2023, experts from Saudi Arabia and the UAE visited. Could this model travel? Maybe, but only under the right conditions. For desert-rich nations like Saudi Arabia or the UAE, the promise is enormous food security in hostile climates, reduced reliance on imports, and a way to stabilize shifting sands. But scientists caution that the MUAS model isn't plug and play. It succeeded because of a rare combination of factors, seasonal floods bringing silt, strong government funding, and thousands of farmers willing to adapt quickly. Without these ingredients, copy-paste attempts could fail, or worse, damage fragile desert ecosystems. That's why visiting experts are studying not just the potato fields, but the entire system's soil science, irrigation management, farmer cooperatives, and long-term ecological monitoring. We came here not just for potatoes, but for the method. If we can adapt even part of this, it could reshape our deserts. The MUAS has become more than farmland. It's a living laboratory, a model others admire, but also a warning that scaling the desert miracle is anything but simple. So what does this story teach us? And you know, what big questions remain? After decades of struggle, experiments, and innovation, the Muas Desert stands as a testament to human ingenuity. From barren sand to thriving potato fields, this story really combines science, determination, and community effort. This isn't magic. It's human ingenuity, careful science, and hard work. The Muas shows what's possible, provided we respect water, people, and ecosystems. Can the world farm the desert, should it? The message is clear audacious goals, backed by research, innovation, and coordinated effort, can transform the impossible into reality. But there's some nuance. Scaling this globally requires careful planning, enough water resources, and a lot of ecological mindfulness. If this story surprised you, hey, subscribe for more deep dives. Tell us in the comments, would you farm the desert? Thanks, see you in the next video.